welcome welcome today i wanted to do another one of these little riff videos where i talk about this topic which i'm going to title as the the perfection of the patterns of life which i think it intuitively makes sense to us what we mean when we say this now this isn't to say that there is this sort of this perfect clearly articulated end goal to all of our endeavours, but rather that we should be in a kind of forward motion towards a kind of perfection, towards a kind of enhancement and improvement to the manners in which we are living, you know. I think we we all wish for that for ourselves, and if we're good, we wish that for others, you know. We wish that they are sort of liberated from their traumatic, negative patterns and energies and that they are in a kind of movement towards healing, a movement towards wholeness and contentment and peace. And by sort of framing this question as the perfection of life's patterns with particularly particularly an emphasis on patterns, you know, it lets us really, you know, step back and look at the the dynamics of our behavior why why do they manifest what are the certain causes and effects that result from them and you know you can think of your entire life as a, a kind of long pattern stretching from the moment you are born to the the moment you die it's a pattern of you know a lot of different complexity and intrigue and you know you are you know, essentially a entirely unique pattern that the sort of universe has created through through you. And, you know, that's something to really step back and, you know, in awe at, I suppose, you know, the fact that, you know, no pattern quite like you has manifested before and likely will manifest after. And you know, to come back to this this question of what perfecting one's pattern is, that you can sort of break this down into the sort of the perfection and enhancements of both the body and the mind. And you know, these these topics, the body and the mind, you know, they're often separated in our very dualistic um, culture and way of thinking about things. But of course, they they are intrinsically interwoven. You know, what you do to the body will affect the mind and likewise how you affect the mind will affect the body you know you can't fully separate the two and you know when we understand this we can you know we can garner sort of more direct methodologies towards affecting both of them because when we look at say the body for example it's very concrete very obvious and clear what one can do to improve the the functioning of the body you know and you know we see this quite obviously through diet and health you know, and exercise you know you know these are very clear and obvious things you know that isn't so that they're easy to you know to implement changes to your diet and implement changes to the way that you're moving and using the body but we you know we we all know we're all taught that it is healthy and good to you know to do these sorts of habits and you know to implement these sorts of patterns into your life the pattern of caring for your body you know caring for your mind is a bit more of a um more ethereal kind of thing you know the mind you know, we're not really particularly conditioned into mindfulness in our education system you know you're not really it's not really encouraged to seriously introspect to seriously question why do i think these sorts of things you know, asking those sorts of why questions those pestering why questions that kids often ask you know they're often conditioned out of them you know and conditioned into just merely accepting things as they are you know but you know i'm I want to save that for later. I want to focus a bit more on the, the body because I think that 
cultivating your care of the body will enable you to be able to better introspect to better you know understand your mind and to better regulate your mind because you know often when we mistreat the body with the food that we eat through being overly sedentary through not getting enough sleep you will see you know the negative effects of that as manifesting in your thoughts as manifesting in low energy low motivation sort of just a sense of apathy and indifference and you know mistreating the body mistreating your sort of your vessel for exploring and integrating with the world you know you are by extinction mistreating your mind you know your you know all the the neurons in your brain and all your your information processing that is necessary for um creating this conscious experience that you have you know, it's very much dependent upon the food that you eat it's very much dependent upon the actions that you're doing you know particular actions you know this you know me gripping my hand that recruits certain neural circuits within my brain you know and and everything you do or the habits and actions that you do um may recruit and strengthen certain neural circuits and you know and basically all the habits that we form are repeated activations within our brain we're, we're sort of we're, we're attuned to trying to find and develop certain patterns and certain more adaptive kind of patterns within the world that's how we sort of evolve and survive we find what's good and what works you know and we really emphasize and enhance that within our reality and um you know this is why you know sweet sugary foods are very um intuitively um tasty and attractive to us because in our sort of evolutionary environment of scarcity we've evolved to really seek out what is most nourishing to us what and you know often that would be very fatty foods very sugary foods which pro provide you know very quick and effective sources of energy and so that's our, pr our primordial ev evolutionary adaptation is to be attracted to those sorts of things to seek those kinds of patterns but of course, this sort of deep ancestral conditioning, which our organism carries from our past, that's co-opted and manipulated in our sort of modern food environment with the ubiquity of fast food and the ubiquity, yeah, ubiquity of processed food, which is designed to really tap into those that those ancestral taste buds, but it doesn't provide the nourishing you know it's deprived of that nourishing factor it just tittles our dopamine receptors and gets us addicted you know many people suffer from addiction to these types of food because they you know they're because they they stimulate those dopaminergic responses you know i, I mean our dopamine motivational system it's it dictates and orients how we act in forward motion in the world what what we are attracted pulled towards doing you know and naturally that if you can create certain technologies certain food technologies i mean and there's also all sorts of other stuff like anything that's a source of addiction it sort of follows this sort of similar machinery of you know stimulating you know short-term high pulses of dopamine within our brains and you know we become attracted to that we want to constantly crave for it and desire it but then our reward system over time and builds tolerance becomes adapted to that source of pleasure and so we constantly need more and more we need sweeter and sweeter foods more and more fast food and um and it's, you know, this addictive loop that cycles us deeper and deeper. And particularly with food, which I, I want to really emphasize and talk about a lot. 
because I, I see how our modern food environment is fundamentally toxic and doesn't nourish us at all. And this this consequence in, you know, population wide metabolic disorders, you know, obesity rates which are, you know, seem to be forever increasing. We um you know, there are whole economies that are built up not to nourish people, not to provide them with nutrient rich food. Well, there are some, but they're few and far between, really. And they tend to be much more expensive than the heavily subsidised fast food um, sectors. And it's, it's a whole ec economy of exploitation, basically, and addiction. And, you know, it's not right, really. Um, and many people, we know this, and yet we, we continue to consume it whilst knowing that it is fundamentally toxic for our body. But this is what happens when the materialistic impulse sort of supersedes, you know, deeper ethical considerations, the, the ethics of caring for people and their health. And, um, you know, these are the structures that our society has erected. These are the patterns that have emerged. It's a desacralization of food. And... Um, And, you know, food is its a very deep foundation of society. And it is a reflection of our society that the foundation of our food is skewed towards convenience and lower pleasures and addiction, really. And to sort of to respond to this as individuals, you know, it's not easy, you know, you have to first acknowledge these addictive patterns that you have in relation to food, how you are sort of engaging in comfort eating, you know, you're sort of filling a kind of void within yourself with this sort of pleasurable stimulus, you know. And this, of course, extends beyond just food to any sort of addictive pattern that you have. You know, they're all just ways to escape from life into some kind of concentrated stimulus that gives you a fleeting sense of pleasure but it's never lasting it's never deeply fulfilling deeper deeper fulfillment really doesn't come in short bursts it's a more of a this an extended sense of contentment an extended sense of enoughness you're not constantly in the state of craving of seeking you're more just flowing you know comfortably And, um, and yeah, so I've talked a lot about food. I'm going to talk a little bit more about exercise. Um, and, um, and we know, we know exercise is, um, it's often you know, heavily encouraged, but not a lot of people find it uncomfortable to put their bodies in stressful situations. And I think that, I mean, exercise is something that's very deep. It's, it's often not acknowledged how deeply philosophical it is. Um, in the past, with the sort of, back in the ancient Greek times, you know, they would have gymnasiums, you know, which would be a, you know, a critical part of the, um, you know, the education system of, you know, philosophers and leaders and stuff. And it is really to encourage people to become connected with their bodies, to, um, connected with their muscles and how to manipulate their body and um, in a sort of energetic fashion. And I think that a lot of people would benefit from exercise that isn't just boring jogging around a block, but more that is embedded within a kind of sport, with it, embedded within a kind of a game, a sense of play. Um, you know, because often, you know, you'll have a certain objective when you're in a sport, whether to win or something or to do something. And you're not, you're not doing the body movements for the sake of doing the body movement, which many people who exercise do. They're just doing it just for the body, which um, for many of us can, won't be that stimulating. You know? But when you're 
doing it as part of a game, as part of an objective, a sport, you know, you know, you you have that extra grit who go beyond when your body is aching, when your body is fatigued, you know, because you have that objective of winning, you know. I think a lot of, I mean, this is why, I mean, it goes without saying, sport is very important, especially for children when they're learning how to use their bodies. But um, so many of us are so sedentary nowadays. Lots of our jobs don't require movement. They require that we sit at desks and stare at screens and consequently we get all sorts of posture issues, all sorts of issues with circulation within our legs because we're not standing up often enough. And, um, you know, it's... um, I, I just think that... The, corner, the foundation of building a more healthier society has to place a huge emphasis upon movement and an emphasis upon the food that we consume. And, you know, it's not you know, a healthy society. It's not one that is sedentary. It's not one that fuels people with packaged and shit food, you know. That is a society that is exploiting people. And is funneling them into nose of a system which does not want to care for them, but rather wants to just extract energy, time, and attention for profit most often. And again, like I said, that's the that's what happens when the materialistic impulse of the society becomes so pronounced that it eats away at everything else, and then it leaves us with hollow souls hollow bodies hollow minds and we become just detached from our bodies especially that's a kind of trauma response really because we cause so much trauma to our bodies with the food that we consume with the actions that we do that the only response for the soul is to disconnect and that's sad really so i guess in this sort of short video i haven't talked too much about precisely the perfection of life's patterns but rather it's you know the first step really which and the first stage is to acknowledge neg negative patterns to acknowledge the patterns that deviate you from feeling healthy from feeling good from feeling high high vibrations high frequency sort of mental states you know and within our sort of society um the most sort of obvious and clear um, aspects of the way that we fall into negative patterns, that we fall into these sort of low vibrational mental states of depression, anxiety, it very much does have some roots within the food that we consume and the bodily movements that we do. So I guess sort of the, the first step that one should take towards affecting their life's pattern is to address those clear foundations and then when you be, go beyond that, when you start feeling healthier within your bodies and just more ener energized, more, more blessed with that sort of vigor to really go out into the world and do stuff, then you can work upon the, the mental side through introspection, meditation, contemplation. When you try and go for contemplation and those sort of more mental-based um, methods, before you start to treat and correct the sort of traumas and maladies that you store within your body, you'll find that meditation will be a much more uncomfortable experience because you will just become, you will just bring into your awareness all the aches and traumas and tension points within your body. And, you know, bring your attention to them isn't going to necessarily heal them within that moment it's more just going to bring it to your consciousness and that will make it more of a uncomfortable experience you know of course bringing these things to your consciousness is necessary before you begin to heal them but i would suggest that people start to heal them first before they engage in a meditation practice by eating better by moving better because then you will start to be able to through meditation be able to tap into more blissful and peaceful states rather than bringing to your consciousness all the negative energies that you're storing up and dissociated from but um yeah 
I hope that was interesting and insightful. Um, you know, I just started yapping really and found myself just fractaling into different sort of stuff. So, yeah, if this is interesting to you, yeah, like and subscribe, all that sort of YouTube shit. But um, have a fantastic day. Goodbye.